Because it hurt so much. Because it was real. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Didn't you ever feel you couldn't live without someone you loved? I know I did when I was in my 20s. I think that's the real reason Brian took Gabby's life and his own. He felt he couldn't stand on his own without her. He couldn't stand to live without her either. I know when I lost someone when I was in my 20s, there was this terrible feeling that although she was still alive, I could never see her again. So it was like almost like a living death. It's like you're broken up. You still love the person, but you can never really see them again. And that's almost like worse than being dead. It's like you, someone's out there and you must kind of let them go. And I'm not sure if you've ever felt that way. I think we are particularly prone to that desperate kind of love when we're emotionally dependent. When who we are is largely a fiction based on what other people think of us. And a function, if not a definition, based on who we are with. The other defines you. But if the other makes you, they can also break you. Before we get going with the rest of this episode, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. So the clip I played at the beginning comes from one of the Hobbit movies where an elf lies over the broken body of a dwarf and exclaims, Why does it hurt so much? And she's told, Because it was real. I think we can take that a step further. Emotional reality may indeed be perceived as real, even more real than real. But my emotional reality and your emotional reality and reality, that's reality with a capital R, aren't the same thing. You may understand what I'm getting at in principle, but in practice, when you talk about something happening in practice, that's another way of saying in reality. It's important to have a deeper understanding of the disconnect between emotional reality and reality, and just how dangerous that can be. You may poo-poo your own disconnect, meaning you may minimize the difference between your emotional reality and reality, but chances are you do the opposite with the person you are with, or someone you frequently share the same space with, perhaps a family member meaning their emotional unreality matters to you, just as yours does to them. When Gabby and Brian were apprehended in Moab, this was an opportunity for everyone to check the reigning emotional reality against reality, with a capital R. What ended up happening was that the emotional reality trumped what was really going on. And what was really going on was that Gabby and Brian were arguing so intensely both were actually injured, and I think a case can be made that had there not been an intervention then, Gabby may have actually been killed even sooner than she was. We know Brian had his hand on Gabby's face and neck during an emotional encounter earlier that day. The Moab cops decided that reality, with a capital R, was okay. The couple were engaged and Gabby was simply emotional. They didn't figure that Brian the real culprit in the Petito saga, was the one with severely unrealistic and ultimately threatening emotions. Or that Gabby's emotions were because of Brian's emotions. That Gabby was responding to Brian. Or that Gabby's emotional reality was right and authentic under the circumstances. You know, another way of looking at that is that Gabby was really, really emotional and she was upset and I think the police looked at that and said, she's too emotional and too upset. And the question is, was she? She was very emotional and shouldn't she have been, especially given where we are now? Emotions when we are experiencing love for the first time take us to the highest highs. And just like a drug, we can experience horrible and terrible withdrawal. If those high emotions can make us feel on top of the world, our shining best strongest selves living our best lives then the low emotions can make us feel worthless and like life is not even worth living this is why it's never a good thing to make a decision when we're emotional what is the common thread through these extremes of feeling its emotions is it reality 
Some of it undoubtedly is. Some of it is anchored on reality. It's a reaction to reality. But it's not reality with a capital R. It's absurd to think, especially as an older adult, that one person can't actually live or survive without another individual. Of course we can. And most of us do. Now may also be a good time to revisit a common area where we tend to develop a common amnesia. Let me ask you this question. What is the difference between emotions and feelings? Which one comes first? Emotions are primary. They come first. They are how our bodies react to certain things happening around us. And so in a certain sense, your emotions are what they are. You shouldn't judge them. You shouldn't necessarily try to change them. But you should observe them. You should have an awareness of them. Your emotions are how your body is reacting to the world and to what is happening to you as you move through the world. And so, in a way, in a sense, your emotions are natural. There's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing to be ashamed of. They come first. And as I said, they are how our bodies react to certain things happening around us. Emotions manifest both unconsciously and consciously, whereas feelings are entirely subjective. Feelings you can kind of do something about, and your feelings about something you can have an opinion about. And you might want to feel embarrassed or or even proud or whatever about a particular feeling you have. But feelings can be changed. You can change your feelings about something just as you change your mind about what you think about something. You can change your feelings because feelings are experienced consciously. They're products of the mind. Emotions versus feelings, so emotions are physical states that arise as a response to external things. Feelings are mental associations. They are Our feelings are reactions to emotions. And you can change how you react. You can intercede at that moment. Emotions are aroused before feelings. Feelings are caused by emotions. Emotions are physical states. Feelings are mental associations and reactions. Those can also be changed. Those associations can be broken, can be altered, can be shifted. And that is why it is good to observe not only your emotions, but your feelings related to those emotions. Emotions can be observed through the physical reaction. So it could be crying, it could be laughing, it could be having no reaction. Also, feelings can be hidden. Emotions are physical, that is the bottom line. Feelings are mental. During the Moab incident, Gabby was emotional. That was obvious. She likely felt sad and uncertain and hurt because of what was happening. Had the two simply been driving to the store, think about that, just on an average day, without the expectations of the whole van life thing, without social media, without this engagement hanging over them, without the rock caverns, etc., without the spectacular setting, if everything was just ordinary, if they were just a boy and a girl, a young man and a young woman driving somewhere, would there have been any reason to argue? And would there be any reason to argue as intensely as they were arguing? Take away the expectations and the fantasy and, the, and that sort of context, but that context is something that is brought about by feelings. And things suddenly become a lot more manageable, don't they? Let me say that again. Take away the expectations and the fantasy and life and spouses suddenly become a lot more manageable. So if you align your psychology with reality, life suddenly becomes a lot easier to deal with. And I think you become easier to deal with in terms of somebody else. When I was in my 20s, I was caught up in a dizzying thrill ride with, I thought, the love of my life. I won't take you through the details, but even though I knew the relationship was ending and I actually broke up with her several times leading up to the great breakup when she finally left and quickly got involved with someone else who she went on to marry, I was devastated. I actually grieved for three years. I was like an emotional cripple limping through life over that period. I remember being at the back of a bus in Scotland during this grieving period early on and suddenly being overcome with sadness and tears streaming down my face. 
and I was suddenly sort of worried that someone might see me. I was sort of almost overwhelmed with panic, you know, that someone might see me crying. But the bus just groaned on and nobody noticed, and that almost made it worse. I suddenly felt really lonely and lost and exposed. Many years later, I learned that this person had divorced her husband and is now with another woman. That suddenly puts all that grief and earnest soul-searching in a strange, new and even silly perspective, doesn't it? Can you see how cha time can change us and also change the context? And so perhaps we shouldn't take things too seriously, including and especially ourselves. And think about how applicable, I mean, we do tend to take ourselves really, really seriously when we are, you know, in our 20s, when we're very young, because we're doing it for the first time. We're getting, we're trying to present ourselves to the world, and it's a serious business. But it's not carved in stone. And, and think about how applicable those apparently wise words from The Hobbit are in my context. You know, um, Yara, I am grieving on the bus. You know, why does it hurt so much? And the elf saying, because it was real. And then qualifying that, well, it was real for you. It wasn't necessarily real and it wasn't necessarily real for her. And one day it's not going to be so real kind of thing. One day I mentioned to Toriel's reality that's in the movie The Hobbit of Hurt was that she completely missed Legolas. She, she didn't really, she had an awareness that he was fond of her, but she also had to be told that and reminded that. And she keep pushing that aside. So yes, she is. Legolas loves her. I think he was kind of a prince. He was the son of a king, the king elf. And Legolas loves her. He's at her side constantly. He's disobeying his father, the king, to run after her, only to see Toriel sort of kind of evade him and develop feelings for a dwarf. And he, he's sort of on the sidelines. He's a prince. He's the king's son. And she's passing him over for a dwarf. She's um, developing all these feelings for somebody else while he's supporting her. That has got to hurt. But the issue is within reality, with a capital R, are the emotional choices we make based on what we see and feel. And that then makes our reality. Imagine if Toriel had just gotten her act together, wouldn't she and Legolas have made a fantastic couple? In other words, somehow just dealt with the fact that her father disapproves. But for T Toriel, Legolas's disapproving dad was an obstacle she felt she couldn't get over, and so she just didn't even try. Perhaps for Brian and Gabby, Gabby's potentially disapproving dad was an obstacle Gabby just couldn't get over, or Brian just couldn't get over, or it was just something that was this idea that they kept talking about or thinking about or worrying about. Or perhaps the disapproval was well-founded. Now, doesn't that appear to be true? Doesn't that disapproval appear to be well-founded? based on where we are now. We are idealistic as young adults. Perhaps that's the most idealistic time of our lives. The trouble is being idealistic when you're in love, especially when you're completely inexperienced, probably means idealizing one another. And idealizing someone can come perilously close to idolizing someone. What happens to idols in the fullness of time? Idols are built up, they worshipped, and then what happens? They fall, they break, they're destroyed. What happens to ideals? Well, ideals can be, kind of be more flexible, but they can also be dangerous. Anne Frank once wrote in her diary, It's difficult in times like these. Ideals, dreams, and cherished hopes rise within us, only to be crushed by grim reality. It's a wonder I haven't abandoned all my ideals. They seem so absurd and impractical. Yet I cling to them because I still believe, in spite of everything, that people are truly good at heart. Be careful how you cling to ideals in the face of grim reality. Grim reality is trying to show you something. Grim reality was trying to show Anne Frank something. You turn away from these revelations at your own peril. You turn away from what happened at the Moab incident. 
and ignore that and forget about that at your own peril. And we know what ultimately happened to poor little Anne Frank. Putting unrealistic expectations on someone else or they on you is a disaster in the making. We can see with Gabby and Brian's van life adventure, there were two, two great expectations written all over it. Ditto the expectations of one another, which is borne out in the Moab incident. Gabby crying miserably, she's injured and mistreated, while Brian's driving recklessly, but he's smug, manipulative and gleeful in the aftermath. Right now, the pandemic is testing our ability to deal with reality, and I don't care who you are or what your position is or what your reality, as a species we have spectacularly failed this test. It remains to be seen for how long we will continue to fail. It remains to be seen for how long we will continue not to see or understand reality, not to know the situation we find ourselves in. But if the pandemic, which still some still don't even believe exists, if it shows anything, it's just how divided human beings are on reality. We see those same divisions in true crime where people can't believe or see the same thing. Or put it this way, they see the same thing and you've got these vastly different interpretations of it and people will say, well, I don't need facts to support what I believe. I simply believe that and that's enough. If we can't agree on that as a species on what reality is, how the F are we going to expect a young, inexperienced couple to find themselves on the same page? Idealism, make no mistake, is an essential quality Making mistakes and allowing ourselves the chance to live and make mistakes without a safety net is often necessary. But there's a difference between idealism and fantasy. Idealism, one hopes, has at least one foot in the real world. Fantasy is a giant leap with both feet into a roiling cauldron. You'll know whether the water is boiling only when it's too late, when you're in it. In a cynical world, idealism is what, keep, is what keeps things happening and keeps things interesting and even hopeful. Without idealists and idealists like Elon Musk, where would we be? And so when the youth are coming into their own, they are confronted with a cynical world and cynical people. And their idealism is necessary to move the world forward, to bring about a new season a new phase, a new era, a new atmosphere. But idealism can also have a dark side. Think of the ideas and idealism behind Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook. Think about how sharing and connecting on a global scale, you might even say oversharing and connecting too many people with too many sort of computers and sharing that, sharing those databases, how that can have a potentially dark political undercarriage. When I asked a divorce lawyer not long ago for the number one reason people were getting divorced, he gave a one-word answer, Facebook. In the Petito case, both Brian and Gabby were idealists, and yet their, their idealism was vastly different. Brian was ultimately idealistic about Gabby, and per perhaps himself. Gabby's idealism about Brian, that he was okay despite his faults, that things were okay even after the Moab incident, ultimately cost her her life. One could argue that idealism is also what cost Brian his life. Take away all those stars twinkling in the young lover's eyes and what happens? They're alive again because they can see. And don't we wish we could have seen more clearly when we were young and felt you know, the I can't live with you, you know, I can't live without you kind of thing. Don't we wish we could have seen that there is life beyond a mere relationship? And there must be. Don't we wish Toriel could have just been brave and committed herself to someone or that Legolas had been more assertive than he was? A big part of idealism, it seems to me, is not only having the courage to make a mistake, but also to own up to it without seeing a mistake as a travesty. There's so many people today who can't say, yeah, I was wrong about that, and own up the mistake almost as a badge of honor. Yeah, I made a mistake. I'm going to make another mistake. I'm learning. I'm growing. It, it's a lifelong process. 
some people were conceived by mistake. Some people's entire lives are a mistake in that sense. But that doesn't have to define you. You can define yourself and redefine yourself over and over again over the course of a lifetime. When things don't work out, you can redefine yourself again. This is who I am. You can choose to do this more and more realistically and authentically with a little idealism thrown in to spice things up. And then see what happens. So I'm not going to take it further than that. It's been quite a long episode. I do want to remind you that I put up a, another uh, video um, in September, the 17th of September uh, last year, that is kind of a uh, cousin to this particular subject, also about motive. And uh, so if you found this episode interesting, you might want to watch Gabby Petito, if there was a motive, what was it immediately after this? I'll put a link to that in the description. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.